You're watching Business Unusual, the weekly webinar series where business leaders and owners uh, get a view of what other business leaders and owners are thinking of during this, the most unusual crisis of our time. My name is Karen Lam. A big thank you to those of you who have tuned in and who also did a little bit of extra work uh, when you signed up for the seminar by posing your questions for our guests today. I've included that in the session. And for those of you who haven't, well, it's still not too late. You can still pose your questions on this platform and I'll see what I can do to get my guests to answer them. Now, the United Nations estimates that by the end of this year, 8% of the world's population, that's half a billion people, will be driven to destitution brought about by the wave of unemployment from the coronavirus. Even if businesses can survive this pandemic, there is the downturn in the economy, there is the weakened markets, there is the dip in consumption, all of which will result in what some have called the third wave of the pandemic, the aftermath. And the truth is a depressed market does no one any good. You are only as strong as your weakest link. So today I'd like to pivot your attention a little bit away from what you may typically have been investing in, the hot stocks, the flavors of the day, to get you to see that there is a way to help fix the damage and yet at the same time not have to sacrifice financial gains. Your classic do good and do well model. I want to show you a recent study that was done by Camden Wealth, which is an organization that looks into the investments of family offices and family businesses. This is a piece of uh, survey that was done together with UBS. And according to uh, Camden, 10% of the investments of family offices go into impact investments. And these are, of course, funds that are channeled into ESG purposes environmental, social and governance. So if you notice in this chart, a bulk of the funds go into the education sector, 45%. Equally weighted is agriculture and food production, followed very closely by money put into energy and resource efficiency, followed by 38% on healthcare and well-being. And of course, environment and con uh, conservation is also there. Now, think about it. What are the businesses right now that are standing, that are thriving while others are shutting down? Education, food, healthcare. In fact, if you were listening in last week on my conversation with Sam Gui, uh, the chairman of DETR Manufacturing, the Popia King of Singapore, the maker of frozen foods, he was telling us about how demand was so overwhelming that despite running his factory, 24-7, he's still unable to meet demand. So my point is that money put into impact investing into these sectors are actually reaping strong returns. Nevertheless, my guest today is not one to look at what's hot in the market. Uh, his principles when he invests in any company is like yours and mine. He looks at the financials. He looks at the scalability of the company. Uh, but he also assesses a company based on its ability to create jobs and to lift the disadvantaged out of their lot. In fact, for him, who he invests in, that is the leaders of the company, is actually just as important as what he invests in. He manages funds that are some of the largest as far as impact investments go. That's about 250 million US dollars. His investors include the Sovereign Wealth Funds of the UK, <coughs> Norway, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation. So his fund managers spread across the world. There's Nova Star Ventures based out of Kenya and Nigeria, uh, Inco in South Africa, Garden Impact working out of Singapore and Spring Hill Equities out of the UK. So the question we have for him today is really, what are the returns from his portfolio? What's he training his eye on right now? And the ultimate question, are impact investments just money that we throw in to charities? So a very good morning to you, Kim Tan, Chairman of uh, Spring Hill Management from where you are based out of the, the UK. Uh, welcome to Business Unusual. 
Uh, good morning, Karen. Good morning. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Yeah. Now, so you've been uh, holed up in your home, probably in what has been the longest period of time that you've stayed at home, isn't it? That's certainly the case. I haven't <laughs> been able to travel. <laughs> And uh, let me give uh, our audience a little bit of a background of who you are. What's a Chinese man working out of the UK? Uh, what's he all about? So um, you still carry a Malaysian passport, am I right? That's correct. Okay, and you grew up in a little town in Negri Sembilan, which is about an hour's drive from the capital city Kuala Lumpur. Uh, you got a scholarship to study in the University of Surrey. And there in the UK, you've remained since. Yeah, the British government has been exceedingly generous to me and uh, uh, gave me a, a scholarship for my PhD. And then after my PhD, I then did three postdoctorate fellowships, courtesy of the of the British government. And yeah, just doing science, uh, and, largely around cancer research and diabetes. And you've been paying off your debt ever since. I've been paying up my debt, trying to, Karen. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, let's get down to business, shall we? Just get the basics and the fundamentals of, of, of what you do uh, out for everyone to know. Um, how many companies are you invested in right now, actively? Actively between our funds, probably around 30, just over 30 of them uh, actively. Then there are obviously my earlier life um, was in sort of biotechnology and and we still have some holdings in in those uh mm -hmm. sort of high-tech type uh, uh businesses right and what are the typical returns that you've been seeing so far in your investments depends uh, if we look at sort of the biotech sector then the, those are big returns um you know in biotech as in tech it, it's a binary it's either a zero or a one so we've had a few zeros, uh, but we've scored quite a few ones. And and then biotech, quite frankly, if if we can't get a 50 times return, we don't even look at the business plan. Great. On the so social impact side, that's very, very different. Um, although we use the same kind of discipline and accountability, we are not looking primarily for those kinds of returns. We're looking in addition to a small financial return. We want to see um, a uh, an impact on the social or, or and the environmental uh, impact. When you say small financial returns, how much? Again, it depends. So we have family offices who say to us, look, you know, we can't take any returns. So they just want their capital back and they are my best friends. Uh, so as long as we return our capital to them, uh, they're, they're, they're happy. Then you have private investors who are saying to us, you know, look, my MD rate is, you know, pittance 0.5%. If you can give me 2%, 3% per annum, I'm happy. Uh, so, so we have those as well. And then we have the institutions where we are now looking to get a, a 10% to 12% per annum type returns for them. 10 to 12, that's definitely above the benchmark of stock market returns, really. Yes, and, and hopefully more uh, constructive. You know, one of the things about us in Asia, um, we, we treat the stock market like kind of casino. And quite frankly, when we buy a lot of these stocks, we buy them short term um, and they don't do that much in terms of building real values for these companies. Mm -hmm. If we're really serious about wanting to use the stock market as it was intended originally to raise capital, to build companies and expand companies, we should be thinking in terms of long term holdings uh, where the money uh, that we invest goes into the company for expansion rather than just as trading stocks. Mm -hmm. And so what a, what's your investment horizon? With all our funds, um, anywhere from seven years to 10 plus two years, so it could be 12 years. So mm -hmm. we are long term investors and, you know, we we uh, we want to help entrepreneurs realize their dreams. So we all, you know, entrepreneurs have have a dream uh, to, to build something and it takes that kind of time 
to sort of build that dream and, and make new products come into markets and so on. Mm. You know, by saying that you've opened the floodgates for our audience right now, who are largely business owners, they're going to come, come knocking on your door very soon. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, we have certain criteria that they need to know about. You know, it's, uh, uh, we, you know, I, I don't do uh, a purely for-profit type uh, investment anymore. Uh, you know, so I don't do high-end science anymore. Uh, the kind of investment that I put time to have got to result in some kind of a social uh, impact mm -hmm. or environmental impact. So now with the let's let's get to where we are right now, right smack in the middle of a pandemic. Um, it's wreaking havoc on on all our investments and in all our businesses. What are the projected returns uh, at the end of your financial year, you think? Uh, it all depends, you know, the, on, again, on the sector. If we're looking at healthcare, that should do reasonably well, although I think even there it'd be impacted because, you know, you have people who are now afraid to go to hospitals, you know, for obvious reasons. And then even in the hospital setting, we have to do uh, social distancing. So you, you can't have the same kind of throughput and footfall. Uh, so I would say all our, our businesses will be uh, impacted one way or another. Mm -hmm. Even our, our so sort of digital type business in the slums in, in Africa, you know, if people are out of a job, they can't then buy uh, top ups for their phones and their data and, and so on. So, so even there we will see uh, an impact. Mm. Well, we'll talk about a little bit about your healthcare businesses in a while, but let's just lay the groundwork right now for this whole idea of impact investments. Um, I, I have mentioned that in a broad, mm. in a broad sense, in impact investments are really just funds that are put into uh, benefiting uh, people socially, benefiting the environment. That's a very, very wide definition, I know. Uh, but some people, in fact, I have had some questions that have come in uh, from some of the participants when they registered for this webinar who had suggested that it's almost counterintuitive to be talking about impact investments in a time like that because there is this perception that impact investments equals CSR equals cost center equals I don't have time for that right now. So can you demystify for us what impact investments are not? Well, it's certainly not CSR. It's not charity. Uh, it's not even uh, responsible investing uh, or ESG type investing. It's intentionally going in and trying to see if you can solve a social problem, a social need using an enterprise model. So instead of doing, think of it in, that instead of doing charity, uh, we go in and use a enterprise model to address the social problem, uh, but at the same time make a profit out of it. Mm. Uh, so, so we look at social problems uh, like prisons, uh, workers from ex, ex sex workers. Um, areas of endemic unemployment, uh, intentionally going in and trying to see if we can create jobs there, uh, providing products and services for the poor in a way so that you make it affordable for them, access to cleaner energy at an, you know, using an affordable model. So, so using an enterprise model rather than doing charity, because I think we all know there is a place for charity. Uh, you know, if you have a tsunami, you have an earthquake, you are going to need humanitarian aid. But longer term, to really see transformation of communities and, and society, we need enterprise. And nobody in their right mind will want to go into a slum to try and make an investment to, to be purely for profit. You know, that's not the place to go to try and make investment to make money. But we can go in using a business model uh, into a slum, build businesses there, and in the process, you know, you can see some some real impact on on the poor of those who live there. Mm. Well, 
let's go back to the beginning of beginning of your journey. So you started off as a biotech entrepreneur. Uh, I dug up, by the way, a very old article about you from The Guardian, who at that time in the year 2000 estimated that you were worth about 350 million pounds uh, from your from your business uh, in, in biotechnology. So you're a scientist in your own right. You are the inventor. Uh, let me see if I get this right of the sheep monoclonal antibodies. I uh, will have another platform to discuss that and um, and you know you you've made your millions uh, way before and at the grand old age of 45 you had decided then that you would retire um, but it was a very interesting family trip to Cape Town that put paid to your retirement plans uh, there was an epiphany that happened that led you down this impact investment journey tell us a little bit about that well, first of all, Karen, you should never believe everything that journalists print in the papers. <laughs> I am a journalist. I'm <laughs> uh, all those numbers are wrong, uh, and you know, but uh, they they love these kinds of, of stories. Um, I took uh, my family on a holiday uh, for the first time into South Africa and I was going to take them on a nice safari, a five star experience, but I didn't think that I could take them to South Africa without showing them the other side of South Africa. And so we spent half a day with one of the big uh, NGOs uh, in the slums and what I saw there just disillusioned me. You know, here I, I, I was all these years doing what everyone what what everybody else does, which is to, to give money to these charities, thinking that things would change. But what I saw on the ground was, you know, it wasn't going to change because they were good hearted people um, with with really great people uh, with good intentions. But they were teaching people to make clothes by hand, furniture by hand, shoe by hand, craft by hand. They were poor quality. Um, and then and then we buy them out of pity. We don't buy them because we really like them and they're really good quality. We buy them out of pity. And I think when you buy, I mean, when you purchase something like that out of pity, it doesn't confer dignity on the on the people who make them. And then I, I realized that, you know, I could write more checks to, to these charities, but it wasn't going to make any difference. And I became disillusioned as, as a philanthropist. Um, and um, and then I remembered what had happened in Southeast Asia. Our Asia tiger economies never had aid, never had charity to speak of, really. Um, not even in the early days, even microfinance. There was no microfinance. And yet, they transformed themselves really because primarily the Japanese companies came into our countries, offloaded their low-tech, businesses, built SMEs, small, medium-sized enterprises in our, in our countries, employed our people, gave us jobs, trained us, and then ultimately inspired a generation of local entrepreneurs who then left those companies to either become their competitors or their suppliers. And I thought, well, you know, is Africa going to be any different? I don't think so. Uh, and, and so there began the journey to say, OK, instead of writing more charity checks, which is just too easy, if you have money, the easiest thing to do is just write a check and forget about it. What is really hard to give is your time. And that was the beginning of a journey of putting in my time and my experience <clears throat> running uh, a biotech VC fund <clears throat> and being a, a, a builder of biotech companies. Uh, to put time into Africa uh, to see if we can, you know, help to build sustainable businesses that have a real transformative uh, impact uh, on, on the community. So and that was really the beginning yeah. of the journey. Yeah, and of course, that's where one of the one of the pilot uh, projects that mm. that that you started uh with was kuzuko kuzuko lodge which is today a five-star uh resort and safari um so south africa has been on a lockdown since late march it's partially lifted now uh, but kuzuko has been a casualty of the restrictions so you started kuzuko really to 
to help the community, to provide jobs for the community. What's happened to the staff there right now? So, uh, so because we have dangerous animals on this, you know, 40,000 acre uh, park that we've restored, so we've got to keep people there uh, to, to make sure that they don't get out. Uh, we still have to patrol the fences each day. So we have retained uh, about uh, 15 uh, people uh, on the game park uh, during this lockdown. Um, the management company, I don't actually manage this. We, we partner with a, uh, a, a very um, reputable firm that runs a chain of hotels uh, in South Africa. Uh, they manage it. Um, and, you know, has unfortunately said to put some people uh, uh, out of jobs and um, and then those and then furlough others on a 40% uh, kind of salary until, you know, this lockdown is, is, is lifted and we can travel again. And now what we've on over and above that, what we've done is really to put a food bank uh, together so that those who have been made redundant, I think about 15 of them, uh, will also uh, be supported through the food bank uh, program. So, so you know, regrettably, the uh, tourism industry has been very, very hard hit uh, throughout the whole of, of Africa and, and everywhere. Uh, hotels, uh, hotels are suffering, uh, airlines, uh, we're going to have fewer airlines after this crisis. Uh, so, so that is a sector that's been very, very hard hit. So, what do you what do you estimate the losses would come up to, at least for Kazuko? I think if we towards uh, our, our year end will be uh, February next year, we expect to start trading again around September, October. Uh, so, if we if we walk away from this uh, with I don't know half a million half a million years dollar loss that that'll be that'll be good mm, mm. that'll be a good result and so you're looking at september as the starting point for tourism to pick up is that right for local tourism i don't think international tourism will pick up mm. what's been the biggest challenge for you kim for as an investor during this time Uh, I think it's been helping our entrepreneurs to sort of have a survival plan. Um, in all our businesses, in all our investments, what we try and do is to make sure that each company has enough cash to survive, say, 12 months. Um, because it, it doesn't matter whether it's a crisis time or, 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 or normal time, cash is what determines whether you survive or you die. It's not about profitability. So in the early years, it's all about cash flow. So we we really try and say to the companies, you need to plan your cash flow out. Um, and all our companies, we try and give them enough cash to get to break even. Um, and, and that may be a year, that may be two years, or that may be uh, six months. So some of the companies have got to break even, but suddenly you've got this crisis and everything shuts down um, and then they're going to need cash. Mm -hmm. So so no matter how well we plan, uh, nobody could have planned you know, this kind of a pandemic. Normally the kind of crisis we have tends to be localized. You know, tsunami was pretty localized um into either countries or regions and others being able to trade this is just global mm. um and uh, so nobody i think has has ever experienced this um so the companies that are, are fortunate in that they have cash to keep running for a couple of years they don't need any help it's those who've got to break even and suddenly have been you know hit by this uh pandemic uh they are the ones that that need uh, that need help. So so that's what we've been really uh, busy with, trying to sort of keep communications going with our, our investments and seeing how we can help them with a survival plan. What's been a continuing theme of your advice for them? 
several. I think one is to keep communications going. I think at this time you need to communicate with your investors, your shareholders, and you need to communicate also with your suppliers. You need to communicate well with your customers. Uh, probably the customer is the most important because you know you got to let them know that you're going to be restarting your business. Um, tell them about the new products that you've got. Um, ask them what else they 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 might be looking for. Uh, so so communicating, I think, with your customers now is really really important. Mm -hmm. But then you need to communicate with your suppliers to say, hey guys, you know, I might not be able to pay you, you know, your 30 day or 45 days or your 60 day type invoices. Um, you know, what can we do? Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and and they will be suffering too. Uh, so hopefully they'll be, they'll be sympathetic. Here in the UK, particularly, I think a lot of the retailers are talking to their landlords to say, hey, you know, we've been shut down for over a month, uh, and it's going to take us several months before we recover. Um, you know, we need to negotiate on 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 the rental. Mm. Uh, so I think you, you do need to talk to your suppliers, uh, communicate with them and then talk to your shareholders and, and your investors, because if you if you do need another round of financing, uh, you, you need to, um, you know, keep them on, on, on side with you. So, uh, so those will be the, the main messages, I would say, mm -hmm. the, apart from the obvious ones like, you know, cost cutting, you know, where where can we trim back? Um, in, in many of the cases that we have, you know, senior managements have taken pay cuts. Um, everybody's taking a bit of a haircut to, to conserve cash. Mm. Uh, you really need to have that cash flow to survive this. Mm. So have you, have you been in position so far in releasing more rounds of funding for your investee companies? We're coming up to it, Karen. <laughs> um, we we have uh, we ha you know so we're just considering these proposals to say you know is this the best use of of our shareholders uh, funds uh, are there others we can bring in to help support uh, the, the the business so yeah we're 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 considering it. Okay, so I've got a question here from someone you probably know, Colin Sui of Project 57. He says hello, <laughs> uh, and hello, his Colin. question is, in the new normal, will you see more investments directed to impact investments or less? I think for the near term, less, uh, because I think people are going to be scrambling to keep their sort of mainstream business going. But I think longer term, the trend is there. Um, Depends how you 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 read the data. Um, the the latest data I saw from uh, Gin, uh, the network, uh, there's two hundred over two hundred billion now in impact investing. I don't think it's as much as that personally. I think it's probably one tenth of that, but that's still a growing number. You know, twenty years ago, the um, when I started, we call it social venture capital. It's only in the last nine years that we have adopted this uh, terminology of impact investing. Uh, so it, it's grown. Um, and, you know, the, the fact that big institutions, sovereign wealth funds are allocating capital uh, into this sector uh, is, is saying, you know, that, that this is something that will grow. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, and why not? If you can get a financial to return and at the same time do good with it. You know, what's not to like? Mm. It's it's obviously not as easy. Um, this is much harder, uh, but I, I would say long term, I think the trend will still be there. But short term, I think people are just going to be using their cash for their mainstream businesses. Oh. Sure. I've got another question. Very good one. Um, when do you decide when to walk away from an investment? Cut your we, losses. Yeah, we as as a fund um, in all the funds uh, that we run, we have a, a you know fail cheap, fail early um, principle. So we will in in the early stage put a small amount of money in. Could be just a hundred thousand US dollars, two hundred thousand US dollars, 
uh, and then we we watch the, the 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 leadership team. Uh, we we sort of monitor them and and grow with them for a year or so, uh, and then decide. And mm -hmm. and we have walked away, um, and that's why you need, uh, either because we we don't think the management team uh, is teachable. So that's one of the major things that we, we look for. We've got to have, you know, if you're going to be, you know, you're going to be working together for 10 years, you've got to be able to um, take criticism, uh, take advice, you've got to be teachable. Um, and, but if you're not, um, you know, th then that's always a time to sort of, uh, of pull out. Or sometimes, a nice innovative idea um, and we fund the pilot uh, and the pilot doesn't work. Um, in which case you just say, hey, you know, it hasn't worked. It's it's it, it, this happens in tech. So, you know, in tech uh, and biotech, uh, you back a particular patent, particular idea um, and sometimes they don't work. And a lot of times they don't work. Uh, and uh, and you just got to walk away. This is why you have a portfolio kind of approach. You know, you will have some that are failures. You'll have a few that are superstars. And then you have a, a middle range of, of, of businesses that are kind of OK to give you a, a small return. All right, now let's um... Assume, well, let's let's just say, looking into the future, the travel ban will be lifted. I'm pretty sure it will be lifted, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. Which businesses are you the most keen to visit? Oh, definitely the game park. <laughs> um, you know, when you don't have humans on, you know, interacting with nature, nature does some surprising things. They recover. Uh, they flourish uh, and so on. So I, I'm just dying to go and see um, some of these games. Uh, we've had pictures of, you know, penguins walking around Simon's Town in Cape Town. That's right, yeah. Lions lying on the road as if they own the roads. Um, and, and, and it's just been phenomenal. So, so yeah, I, I would say just a visit to some of these nature parks would be uh, would be the first thing to do. Fantastic. Ah, oh, I wish I could go with you. Yeah. Come. <laughs> you're, all, you're all invited. <laughs> all right. Um, let's talk about something that I think you're quite passionate about, judging from your portfolio, healthcare. Uh, so you've got several chains of medical centers throughout Africa. You also invested in pharmaceutical companies there. Uh, you've also got a, a, an investee company in Thailand. Um, now, healthcare is traditionally, of course, a defensive stock. In fact, on the S&P, you know, it, it was an underperformer for the last couple of years. What drew you to healthcare other than the most obvious, which is the fact that you're a scientist? I think that's the only thing really, Karen, you know, you stick with what you know. Uh, I, I know nothing about tourism. I know nothing about hospitality. Uh, so it's always very dangerous to go into areas you don't know. Um, and that's why you have to work with really good partners. You work with partners who understand animals. You work with partners who understand the hospitality industry. But healthcare is, is, is something that I understand and know. Um, the company in Thailand, the reason behind that was I became very kind of dissatisfied uh, in Africa. All the diagnostic tests and, and a lot of the medical stuff were, are all imported. And they're imported in US dollars. And, and quite frankly, you know, African countries can't afford that. And I said, you know, why why are we importing this? We should be transferring technology and manufacturing these products in country locally. So Thailand was was one that we found. This is a U.S. company that wanted to offload its manufacturing into Asia, uh, and we invested uh, through the Gardner Impact Fund uh, in this company called Kestrel, mm -hmm. and uh, they are local manufacturers of these rapid tests, bit like your pregnancy tests uh, for malaria for dengue fever, for hepatitis, for HIV AIDS, uh, and for some of the sexually transmitted 
transmitted diseases. And the, the, the whole rationale there is that we would do local manufacturing at lower costs to sort of supply uh, the Asian market. Mm. So that's that's that was the 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 reason why we invested uh, uh, in that. We need we need to do more to try and and have businesses in our various regions uh, manufacturing medical products, uh, not just drugs, but but also diagnostics. Mm. And is, is Kestrel the one that's coming up with the, with the uh, COVID-19 rapid test kit? It is. Um, so the story there is um, the Transformational Business Network, uh, TBN. It's it's a network of basically a few thousand disillusioned philanthropists and repentant bankers uh, who realize that writing checks uh, to charity isn't enough. We, we have to put in time and, and expertise. Uh, and, and so TBN, I think collectively as a network, decided that we wanted to make a collective response to the, the pandemic. And, and this, is, this is what we, we are aiming to do, to commercialize a rapid test for COVID-19 antibodies, um, make it as affordable as, as possible. And what primarily. would that be? Affordable as, as, as affordable it, as it, possible? It, it, it would be sub two dollars to the end user. Uh, what the transfer costs and so on and so forth. You know, there has to be some profits built in for the uh, wholesalers and, and mm -hmm. distributors. Um, but we hope that you know, to the end user, it would be less than two two dollars uh, per per test. Okay. So um, just to and, give our audience so, perspective, sorry, Kim. Just to give our audience perspective, two dollars. And right now, how much would a, a a typical test kit cost? An antibody test is anywhere currently between ten to twenty dollars per test. Mm. A DNA PCR test, which is the kind of reference uh, lab test, is anywhere from a hundred to two hundred dollars, and that takes can take three days because you get to take the swab, send it into the central lab, and get your result back. These tests run for five ten minutes. You can do it by the roadside, and and quite frankly, if we before we get to to vaccine being available and even after a vaccine is available, we need to know what percentage of the population uh, have got antibodies in them. Uh, and and that, that's why these kinds of tests uh, are, are important and, and we've got to make it affordable, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting that you've decided that, you know, to, to invest in a lab in Thailand. Thailand is an naturally known as the hub of life sciences. What drew you there in the first place? Just an entrepreneur who had, you know, set up the, the manufacturing plant. But don't forget, you know, Thailand, because of SARS, uh, have a lot of experience uh, with, with, with this coronavirus uh, uh, variant. So so there's a lot of, uh, you know, stuff there. And, and we are basically um, leveraging off our existing know-how of, of making these rapid tests for dengue fever particularly to, to make this new test. Um, so, so there's a lot of expertise there and we will be able to get a lot of samples uh, out of Thailand as well. Mm. Um, all right, I have a question that's come in from someone else you do know as well, Melvin Mark. And, uh, <laughs> he's trying to put you in a spot right now and he's asking what are the global responses from impact investing ecosystems uh, to support social enterprises in terms of cheaper loans? That's a tough one. You know, like I said, I think with the kind of crisis, most people are, are using their cash to keep their mainstream uh, businesses going. Uh, keep their foundations and their charities go. We, we're going to see a lot of charities closing uh, during this period as well. Uh, so, so they they also need um, a lot of uh, financial support. Mm. So there are, there are not that many, uh, sadly, I think, really lending a helping hand now uh, at this time to these social enterprises. Um, you know. We within our network, uh, within the TBN network, uh, would be one of them. Um, there is another group called 
Open Road Alliance uh, based out of the US. Um, there they will do uh, low cost, int uh, low interest rate loans uh, to existing uh, social enterprises. Um, not many, sadly, um, mm -hmm. you know, because of the crisis. So, so all these social enterprises that, that you know we have in Asia, particularly, they are going to need a lot of financial help uh, at this time. Otherwise, we're going to see a real you know, bloodbath. Mm, uh, absolutely. With, with Let's um, turn our attention now to some of your portfolio in Southeast Asia. You've mentioned Garden Impact. Uh, that's the fund that takes care of uh, of investments in Southeast Asia. So um, they've got a variety of businesses. Uh, they're invested in business process outsourcing all the way to digital education. Which are the ones right now that are doing better and which are the ones uh, that are lagging? Um, hard to say. I think probably the ones that are doing well would be the, the healthcare, the, the diagnostics. I think um, Agape is, is one. You know, this is a call center inside Changi Prison. Uh, where, it, where we have male prisoners as well as, as uh, women prisoners. And then when they are released, we rehire them in a call center outside. So um, up until uh, recently, uh, we probably had about uh, 60, 80 men and about um, 80 women uh, in inside prison running these call centers. Mm -hmm. So they're, do they're doing well. Um, they could do better. <laughs> Uh, because obviously they're serving businesses and if the businesses suffer, uh, they will suffer too. It will have an impact on them. Um, what's great at the moment with Agape is, is they've been commissioned by the Singapore government to um, connect people who are mentally and emotionally distressed, uh, who can dial a certain number and then they're patched on to counselors. Mm. Uh, you know where they can and, and talk and and, and share the, the 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 problems, so that that's a great thing to be able to do at this time. And then they've been involved with uh, helping to feed a lot of the migrants. So, you know, those of you in Singapore will realize the problems with the migrants. Um, and out of their own initiative, this this wasn't planned. Uh, people within Agape have got together with others and, and they're feeding about, I think, 3,000 people uh, mm. each, each day, migrants. So, so they, 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 are doing, uh, they are doing well. The, the companies, the businesses that aren't doing so well will be something like affordable housing because nobody's <laughs> building any houses yep. uh, at the moment. So uh, affordable housing is a really interesting business. Uh, we build houses from a plant called Kanef, which is a hibiscus uh, variety, which grows really fast. Um, and we use the core just chipped and, and uh, mixed with lime to build houses, to build low cost houses. Uh, no sand, no cement. Uh, so really genuinely green houses has a strong impact on the poor because it's farmers who are growing this cash crop. Mm. Uh, but until the economy recovers, nobody, you know, there's no budget to 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 build houses. Mm. So, so as I said at the very beginning, Karen, you know, all our businesses, no matter which sector, uh, are affected. Yeah. Uh, well, one sector that's particularly uh, affected at least positively is in the area of agriculture and that's something that you're also rather bullish about. Uh, what drew you into agriculture in the first place? Well we all we can all live without um, internet but we can't live without food right? You tell that to my so, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I, I've got more and more interested in this whole area of organic farming because I've seen the destruction to our environment through the kind of Western style farming, which is really unsustainable. You know, we we throw a whole ton of chemicals every year onto the soil just to uh, you know to, to grow crops. 
and every year we just degrade the land. And I just think that that's, that is not a, a really good way of, uh, of doing farming and, and food production. So we've been interested to see, you know, to look at alternatives. And um, I visited um, a, a farm out in Texas a few years ago and saw how just on 80 acres they were able to do organic farming which I always thought was kind of a bit niche and, um, you know, small scale. But here were these farmers uh, rotating their crops, rotating their animals around each day, uh, fertilizing the land. The land each year gets, you know, more and more productive, more and more fertile rather than, than the opposite. And they were supplying the Whole Foods uh, chain, which is now obviously bought by Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, so Amazon is, is, is really getting into this as well. And I think more and more people are saying there's got to be a better way to, to, to grow crops. So we have this business in, in Ethiopia called Green Path, uh, which is uh, working with largely women farmers who own largely one acre of land. We help them with seedlings. We help them with, with technology of, of, of looking after the, the, the crops and, um, and we provide uh, all the support that they need and it's organic and we harvest and we export. And, and just working with one farmer at a time, we're now up to about 250 acres mm -hmm. of farmland and that's all exported. So there's a much healthier way. And, and furthermore, in, in that particular business, uh, we do what is called permaculture. In other words, in, 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 instead of doing monoculture, just one crop, we mix these crops up. And these mixing of crops actually help each other, not just with nutrients, but some of them help protect them from insects and, and, and worms and so on. So, so we're, we're, we're learning a lot about permaculture and, and how then we don't need to add chemicals uh, onto the soil. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's been a, 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 a good bit of learning. Zambia is, is interesting in, in, in that we have a business that uh, producing honey. So we hang uh, wooden beehives in trees um, and we come and harvest once every six months. Uh, we, we weigh and then we pay the farmers. So we work with over 90,000 farmers. We have 90, uh, about 10,000 uh, beehives currently hanging in, in, in the forest. And, and, and by having about 20 beehives each, it doubles their annual income uh, for these farmers. Mm. Um, and and, and the, the benefit of it is, you know, it's, it's a passive income. They don't need to look after it. It just hangs on trees and it protects the trees. We've ended up protecting the forest because they don't chop the trees down anymore, you know, because they have income from the trees. So, so we are learning, uh, we're still learning uh, and uh, there are still experiments that we want to do about how to do more sustainable, uh, wholesome agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, and Africa is great, you know, uh, Kenya and Uganda particularly, uh, and parts of Zimbabwe, the rainfall is, is just like Malaysia. You know, you, you have rainfall, soil is fertile, hasn't been uh, exposed to chemicals for, for, for generations. Um, so those of, of you who are in the food production, you know, think about Africa, come to Africa and, and invest in Africa farming. This is where uh, the future is going to be. Mm -hmm. Labor is still cheap, land is cheap. Um, so so we, we're, we're, we're keen to do more. Mm. And you have a lot of room to do more as well, I'm sure. So let's, uh, time is running out. So I just want to move our attention right now to your forecast for post-crisis, for a post-crisis world. Uh, what will change, you think, in the way we do business from here on? I think, um, well, put this way, I, 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 I'm not a, a, a sort of futurologist, but this is what I would like to see happening. I think I would like to see us 
being uh, kinder, I think, uh, to ourselves in, in terms of how we work. Um, you know, this kind of one hour of stressful commuting every morning and another hour every night, it's just not good for, for, for us, right? And, and so I think, I hope more and more companies will allow people to work from home where, where they can. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked from home for the past 30 years and, and I would never change. Uh, it's just fantastic. Um, so, so that that's one hope, and and the impact of that is, I think we have a better quality family life. We have a better quality, um, you know, we, we we have better quality air uh, that we breathe. There's going to be less pollution. You know, parts of India can now see the Himalayas for the first time in mm -hmm. generation. I mean, that that's fantastic. So I, I'd like to see that. So because I think that will have an impact not just on the environment, but will have an impact on us in, in our family and on our society. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I really would like to see that. Yeah. I think also what will change is I think we'll rethink our supply chain. I think there will be some onshoring of production, obviously. You know, this just in time manufacturing was the kind of mantra, okay? Well, just in time manufacturing works fine until you have a crisis like we have and suddenly it doesn't work. And I think more and more countries are going to have to think about how to become a bit more independent in terms of their food security, in terms of their supply chain. So I, I think that that will that will change uh, a, a little. Mm. The biggest fear I have, Karen, is this, you know, the poor are going to be the most impacted by this crisis. Mm. Inequalities is actually going to be worse after this crisis. So how are we uh, going to address the the inequalities uh, that will result from this? The, the poor are really going to be really, really hard hit. Mm. Well, that's a question I would pose back to you, Kim. How are you? going to help to lift go, these, this go out and, and Go out and build some more of these businesses amongst the poor. Excellent. What else can we do? What else can we do? Lifting poverty through enterprise. That's always been your mantra, hasn't it? Yeah. OK, um, so you, you were mentioning this thing about food security. Uh, let's let's take it down into a more micro level. Um, how can businesses get in on that conversation on food security to to you know that to to have more p you know ppp partnerships for instance public uh, private partnerships government to business partnerships what should businesses be doing to get in on these bigger national issues that will arise i think ppp is always difficult you know um i have uh, you know, I, I've tried not to work with governments uh, because it, it just is just complicated. <clears throat> and um, you know, I would just say to these to to the entrepreneurs who who, who are on this call, you know, just get on and do it. Uh, you will find um, it, it's actually easier than you think, as long as you you get the local community to work with you. That's the key. Uh, you've got to go in, find a, a, entre, a local entrepreneur who, whose, whose heart is, is, is in it, uh, who is really committed, back them, get the community involved with you, uh, then, then it will work. Mm. You know, but don't go in and just think about you know, exploiting it for yourselves. I think if you, if you go in and, and the community can see um, that this benefits them, yeah, they, they'll come alongside you. So we've got, even in Asia, we've got lots of acreage of land that, that isn't used, right? Um, there are unused that really can be used for food production. Mm. If you, we wait for the government, it's just not going to happen. I think we need local entrepreneurs, private guys like us, to say, let's go and talk to the people in that kampong and uh, see what we can do. You know, can we... Can we just grow basic things? You don't need to be that smart. Just grow some basic stuff. We've got acreage of um, paddy fields that are not used anymore. 
Well, how about reopening some of them? Instead of having to import rice into Malaysia, you know, maybe we should become sufficient and become an exporter of rice. Mm. Who knows? So, so I think, you know, rather than waiting for governments and, and trying to do deals with governments, I would just say to, to the private guys, just, just go and do it. Mm. Do it with a community. Absolutely. S um, all right. So do you want to give a plug to your upcoming uh, Transformational Business Network Asia conference? I, I believe there's something up coming up uh, in late May, I think it is. Uh, that's correct. Uh, so this is TBN Asia. And um, we've been running a conference each year. Uh, last year was in KL uh, with about 400 people. The year before that was in Jakarta with about 700 people. And there we bring together a whole community of uh, people who are interested in social enterprises as well as impact investing. So we have usually, you know, about 100 companies or so who come and, and, and uh, exhibit. And then we bring alongside that a whole bunch of um, investors and, and, and uh, impact funds. Are you and expecting of, quite a few? Are you expecting less investors this year? Uh, probably. I think realistically, Karen, if people's attentions are being uh, distracted currently, and um, but we'll see. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that there will still be people who are, you know, longer term in their planning um, and will come along and, and, and support these uh, businesses that are intentional about helping the poor. Uh, are helping marginalized groups. Mm. So we'll we'll see. So come along and 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 it's virtual anyway, so you can do it from your home and uh, anywhere. So give us your final parting shot uh, for for those of us who are involved in business, where you know we're trying to keep our head above the water, we're conserving as much as we can of our reserves. Uh, and yet at the same time, you know, here you are talking about communities and and helping people, you know, how how do we do that with such limited resources? I would say the most important thing for us as business leaders is to lead by example. Um, at this time, you know, not only are, is the world watching, but also our employees, our staff are watching us. And, and when they can see that we are willing to take the pain, um, they will be more willing to take the pain as well. I love, I love uh, CEOs who've gone to their senior managers and say, look, you know, we have two options. One is we can retrench people, or two, we can all collectively take, you know, a haircut, uh, and then we don't and, uh, retrench anybody. And I think it's that kind of leadership that I think is 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 needed, mm -hmm. and and you know, I, I I throw this out. There there is huge inequalities in our pay structure, and part of it is actually driven very much by the um, head hunting uh, fraternity. Um, you know, who think that a CEO must be paid ten million dollars, but his cleaner in the same company is paid ten thousand dollars. And, and, and that kind of, of disparity, I don't think long term is sustainable. And this is a good time for us to maybe reset that. Surely it's immoral that a nurse, um, what, what a, a banker earns in one year, a nurse could never earn in a lifetime, right? There's got to be some sense of, of morality about, about you know this these kinds of inequalities and and it's the inequalities also that that is actually going to slow us down in terms of recovery so I, I i hope that you know as business leaders we can lead by example mm. well said kim well said i think it's really leadership is really best seen in a time of crisis and, uh, you know, you've always, always been an inspiration, not just to me, but to the many, many people who cross your path and, and whom you have inspired to, to start businesses uh, by looking at the, the community. So I thank you so much, Kim, for your time. Thank you for taking this 
uh, morning. I know that you are inundated with Zoom calls throughout the day with your many, many investees. So we really appreciate your time. No, oh, it's been a great pleasure and uh, all the best, everybody, and keep going. Thank you. So now, all that after all that Kim has said, you know, the whole idea of doing well and doing good, I hope you get the, the, the sense that it is not just a charitable concept. Our systems have broken down. Uh, world leaders are confounded. Uh, the foundations on which we have built our businesses upon have disintegrated. And it's time for us to go back to the drawing board. And that's why this series is called Business Unusual, because I don't believe that things will go back to the way they were before, at least not in the short to medium term. So the economy needs fixing and governments cannot be the only ones, as Kim has pointed out. We as business leaders need to step in and step up. So I hope Kim's views have given you some idea of what the new business environment may look like and perhaps even give you given you a vision of your part in fixing all that needs to be fixed to get the world right side up again. Before I sign off, I want to give you a quick heads up on who's coming on next week. I have, and I'm very excited to have, Indonesia's one of Indonesia's captains of industry. I use captain in a gender neutral sense. She is Wendy Yap, the founder and president of Nippon Indosari Corpindo, the makers of Indonesia's best-selling mass market bread, Sari Roti. Wendy will be here to talk about her maneuvers through the disruptions brought about by the pandemic in a country as populous and far-flung as Indonesia. We'll talk to her about the problems of distribution and operating in a lockdown. I just got off the phone with her yesterday. You don't want to miss some of the stories that she has to tell you. So join me next Tuesday, uh, 11 a.m. We go back to our original time of 11 a.m. by signing up right now because places are limited. Well, until then, from all of us here at Business Unusual and also from our technology partner, VLAN Asia, I'd like to remind you that we are better and stronger when we stand together. So mask up and carry on.